All right, guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Well, this is the last video of 2023, and what an incredible year it's been. So thank you, each and every one of you, for your support. A couple of weeks ago, we hit 100 million views in total, which is just unbelievable. I never thought that would happen. And we also hit 350,000 subscribers. And honestly, it just means so much to me, so thank you very much. Today, I thought I'd do a little recap of some of the best and worst cars I've either driven or bought this year. When I was working out this list, the list of bad cars actually outweighed the good, but uh, anyway, at least it kept you all entertained. There are also lots of occasions where I've massively overspent. I think next year, going forward, I'm going to try my best to try and, try and be a bit more careful with my spending. In fact, that can be my New Year's resolution, can't it? I'll probably break it by, well, by the end of this video, but I will try my best. Right, let's get going. Right, then we might as well start with the good cars, and we'll do the bad later. In fact, had I done this before Christmas, we could have done a, a naughty and nice list. Anyway, I've missed that opportunity. So one of the best cars I've driven this year was the Jaguar F-Type Convertible, 3.0-litre supercharged V6. I did that video back in January this year, so the weather conditions weren't great, but I really enjoyed that. I spent most of the day with it, and the fact that you can pick those up now for about £25,000 or less. Just an unbelievable amount of car for the money. They sound awesome, they drive really well, the handling's perfect. I'm not completely sold on the styling, as I said in the video, but, I mean, it still looks good, it still turns heads. It's just a really fun car to drive and be in. I really don't know what Jaguar are thinking of, but the F-Type's been discontinued, so you can't go and buy a brand new one, even if you wanted to. Next up on the nice list is the Porsche Boxster, specifically the 987. Now, this is the model which ran from 2004 to 2005, and they're really good cars. The video that I did just featured a 2.7 litre base Boxster. It wasn't even the S, and I had a really good time filming with that. Again, a bit like the F-Type, they just handle like a dream. And you've still got the looks of a Porsche, the quality. It's just a, a really good car all round. And you can pick them up for well under £10,000. If you're looking for a fun second car or a weekend toy, then you really need to look no further than the Boxster. The good thing about the 987 is that it's a little bit more modern and better looking, in my opinion, than the 986. The 986 had those weird lights, whereas the 987 was just a, a cleaner design. Next up, we've got, in my opinion, the best budget supercar. I think you can call it a supercar, can't you? The BMW i8. Now, the i8 is a really special car. I just think they offer so much for so little. You can pick them up now for well under £40,000. And thanks to the hybrid drivetrain system, they're not expensive to run either. You get supercar looks with its fancy butterfly doors, you get almost supercar performance, in a straight line at least, and an awesome interior. I just think it's a really good all-rounder. The boot space isn't the best. In fact, practicality. Listen, if you're thinking about buying an i8 for practicality, then that probably isn't the best idea. But as a, as a second car or a weekend car, again, it's just a very interesting choice, I think. Speaking of practicality, if you need something roomy and practical and versatile, then look no further than the Audi SQ5. I was really impressed with this car. Here in the UK, we only got the diesel, so it's a three litre twin turbocharged diesel, and it flies. It even sounds good. Yes, the interior is a little bit dated, but it's still really good quality. You can pick up good examples for £20,000 or under, and again, I just think it's an awful lot of car for the money. Here you've got a practical, medium-sized all-wheel drive car with plenty of boot space and plenty of space for your passengers, and 330 horsepower. But if you need something bigger than an SQ5, perhaps the next car on my list is a bit more you. That's the Volvo XC90. The model I drove in the video was a 2017 R design. Now, they all have that 2-litre either diesel or petrol engine. I think they could have done with a 3-litre, to be honest. A 3-litre would have suited the car a bit better. It's a big car, and a 2-litre sometimes doesn't feel quite up to the job. But still, for most people, I think it does a really good job. You get a beautiful interior, plenty of space for seven people, and I think it's a really handsome car. In a good colour in our design spec, I just think they look stunning. And it kind of, it kind of flies under the radar a bit. You get all the benefits of owning a Range Rover without people seeing you drive a Range Rover. I mean, they're not the most popular cars on the road, are they? And you can pick them up for around 20 grand. Again, bargain. If the XC90 is too big for you, then what about a Mini Cooper? I've mentioned in many videos that I'm not a big fan of the new Mini. The Mark 1 and 2, I think, are just terribly unreliable. But the Mark 3, like the one I drove in this video, I was really impressed with. Now, this was a Cooper SD, and it was properly quick. It handled really well, it was just really good fun. Yes, they're not the most spacious cars, the boot space isn't brilliant, and the rear legroom isn't terrific. But if it's just you and perhaps one other person, they're really good cars. 12 or 14,000 pounds should get you a really nice example. The one that I drove was an automatic, which is what I'd recommend. At the other end of the spectrum, if you've got 225,000 pounds to spend, then you really need to go and check out the new Bentley Bentayga. 
The one that I did a video with, which was kindly lent to me by Bentley Manchester, was brand new that morning. It was just registered. It had done 10 miles when I got behind the wheel. And that was a 4 litre twin turbocharged V8 petrol. They've done away with the W12, which I don't think is any bad thing, to be honest, because the V8 is more than adequate. You get 550 horsepower, it's really quick in a straight line, it's so luxurious, it's unbelievable really. Granted it is an eye-watering amount of money, but if you're at that sort of level, there's not an awful lot else to compare it to. And that is certainly one of the best cars I've driven in 2023. Plus on the bright side, you can pick up early examples from 2016 for around £70,000. If you're looking for the perfect GT car, then you really need to check out one of these. Now I actually bought this car for myself. It's a 2010 Jaguar XKR with a 5 litre supercharged petrol engine. It produces 510 horsepower, it sounds awesome, they look awesome, I'm really happy with it. You can pick up a decent used example for around £20,000. And I can't think of another car for that kind of price that does a better job than that. Every single time I drive that car, bar none, I find myself grinning ear to ear. It's just an awesome experience. The only downside to the XKR is the miles per gallon. You'll be doing around 18 average. And if you can't stomach that and you're a bit more modern than I am, Perhaps you need to try an EV. Now the best EV I've driven all year, hands down, is the Genesis GV70. I'm not afraid to admit that I'm something of an EV skeptic. I've mentioned this many times, but I just don't think we're ready for them. We just don't have the infrastructure in place. But that said, if you can make them work for you, then I do see the appeal. And the Genesis GV70 is without doubt the best one I've driven. It's quick, luxurious, interesting, good looking. It's just got an awful lot going for it. Yes, it's expensive, but all EVs are. I don't want to rattle on too much about each and every car, so I'll leave the links below so you can check them out for yourself if you've missed them. The last on the list then, and many of you will disagree with this, is my Jaguar X-Type 3 litre V6 Sovereign Estate. I really like that car. I bought it for just, I think I paid £1,000 for it, and then spent £4,200 on it, and then sold it for five grand. Cracking businessman answer. But I really like that car, there was just something about it. It's all-wheel drive, it was automatic, it was a top spec. I even quite like the colour combination. Sadly, like most X-Types of that era, it was a little bit rotten. And when I say a little bit, I mean quite a lot. It needed both sills replacing and various bits and pieces that cost me thousands of pounds. Still, it's got a nice new home now, and hopefully it'll be on the road for another three, five, ten years. Who knows? Right, on to my top ten worst. You ready for this? First of all, then, the Sangyong Tivoli that I bought with a noisy engine. I bought this car for, I think, two and a half thousand pounds, and luckily I sold it for two and a half thousand pounds, so it wasn't the end of the world. I bought it from a local main dealer, and I didn't even know what one was. I just said yes to it, because, you know, what's the worst that could happen? When I got to it, I realised it had a noisy engine. It had only done 60,000 miles or something, but they're obviously not very well built. It was quite a quirky car, it was quite a good spec. I seem to remember it having heated seats and reverse camera and all that sort of stuff. But you also had to wear ear defenders when you were driving it. So it wasn't the best two and a half grand I've ever spent. Next, my supercharged Range Rover. Now what an absolute lemon this was. I paid, I think that was two and a half grand as well. There's a bit of a theme here, isn't there? It got trailered to me and the description of it wasn't, well, it wasn't the most honest description, but my fault, I suppose, for buying something unseen. It was a £2,500, 4.2 litre supercharged Range Rover from 2006, and it was an absolute nail. It was just horrible. It hadn't been looked after. Somebody had put a horrendous exhaust system on it. They'd made it run an LPG, and it, it barely did that. It was just, yeah, one of the worst things I bought last year. I sold that for, I think I got £2,000 for it in the end. Sold it to a mate of mine who was just going to tinker with it. And then I think he put it on eBay, sold it for a slight profit. I think he made a couple hundred pounds and that was that. I don't know where it is right now. Hopefully someone spent some time and money on it and it's still running, but I'm not sure. If you don't want to make the same silly mistakes that I seem to make, then before you hand over any cash for a used car or motorbike, then you really need to check out his history using Car Vertical. If you use my promo code HIP, you'll get 10% off each and every vehicle check that you do. And it's a really thorough check. It doesn't just work here in the UK, it works in dozens of other countries. And they check hundreds of millions of cars. It's a really easy system to use. All you do is go to carvertical.com, type in the vehicle reg or the VIN, and then hit search. You'll have your report back in a couple of minutes and it'll tell you whether it's ever been stolen, written off, had a mileage rollback, or has outstanding finance on it. Occasionally, if it has been involved in an accident or it's been advertised previously by somebody else, you even get photographs of it. It's a really thorough check. Take, for example, this Abarth 595 that I bought recently. When you type the reg into car vertical and do a check, it shows that it was a cat S, so it has been involved in an accident. In addition to that, it shows you all the MOT history, the advisory items, and sometimes it even shows you the average market value, which is quite handy for somebody like me. 
So don't forget to check them out and use my promo code HIGHPEAK for 10% off. I'll leave the link below in the video description. Right, onto the third mistake of 2023. The blue Citroen C4 Picasso that ended up being scrapped. That was an absolute... I'm running out of words. Turkey. Parcel. It was just an absolute... heap. In typical French fashion, it had every single warning light on. It wouldn't change out of third gear. ESP fault. ABS fault. Engine light. Handbrake fault, gearbox fault. What an absolute turd. So it'd only go at 30 miles an hour. It knocked, squeaked, banged. It really wasn't good. On the bright side, I paid 300 pounds for it and then I got, I think I got 300 pounds back for it in scrap. I might have got 270, I'm not sure, but still, I thought that was a good price to pay to get one of those hateful cars off the road. That of course was a French car. So you'd think my next car on the list being Korean would be a lot more reliable. This was that Hyundai Matrix that I bought which, as it turned out, didn't have a chassis. It was completely rotten as a pair. It was quite, well, it wasn't nice. It's a Hyundai Matrix designed by Pininfarina on a bad day when the power was out, I think. But underneath, it looked as though it had been parked on a beach. It was just completely rotten. So again, that one, yeah, that was scrapped as well. Right, next one there. Oh, this has been scrapped as well. Right, next up, a Honda Civic that I bought. Now this had only done I think it had done 30 odd thousand miles or 40,000 miles. It was really low mileage, but it had been sitting for a number of years. So I thought, naively, that I could get it back on the road. That wasn't the case. It needed, well, it needed thousands of pounds spending on it. So I had a rare moment where I had my sensible hat on and I decided the best thing to do would be to scrap it. I paid 400 pounds for it and got 250 in scrap. Very good. Next up on my list didn't get scrapped. I rescued this one, but it's on my worst list because the condition of it when I bought it was so bad, I couldn't not include it on this list. It was a Mark II Land Rover Freelander. Now they usually, I'm quite a fan of them, they're usually really good cars. But this one hadn't had its cam belt done, there was a bit of body damage, it needed some tires. What else was wrong with it? It had been smoked in, so it smelt like a, a vault in a pub. It was missing its parcel shot. It was just a really neglected car. I bought it for I think 1500 pounds. And in the end, I sold it for five grand or five and a half grand, but I did massively overspend. I spent, I think about 4,000 pounds on it. Anyway, next up, uh, what's next on my list? An Audi TT that I bought. Now it was a 2004 Audi TT in red. Initially, I was quite optimistic. I really liked the Mark 1 TT, but this wasn't a good example. I bought it blind from a viewer and the description wasn't wasn't entirely honest. So when it arrived, I discovered it had an airbag light on, there was only one key, no service history, the sills were rotten, and it had been painted by, I think, Stevie Wonder. The paint job on it was awful, there was overspray everywhere. So that was a complete waste of time and money. I bought it for £1,800, I spent £270 getting it delivered here, and then I sold it for, I don't even want to admit this, £800. I made a loss of over a thousand pounds. My fault for not checking it out first, but I'm that busy. I just buy a lot of cars without seeing them first. Sometimes they're, well, most of the time they're all right because I get an honest description. Sometimes some cars like the TT just slip through the net and end up biting me in the bum. Next up then, ah, I remember this one. This was filthy. This was a cheap Ford Fiesta ZTech S that I bought for a thousand pounds. It was gray, quite good looking, but it just hadn't been looked after at all. So I spent, I think I spent about 2000 pounds on it and then sold it for three and a half grand. So I did profit slightly. I think I made 200 pounds on it. I was quite pleased that I'd saved it because I quite like them, but in hindsight, it wasn't really worth rescuing. The penultimate car on my list might surprise a few of you. A few months ago, we went down to Cardiff to a place called Car Chase Heroes, who kindly let me walk around their inventory and see what they had in stock. You see, they rent out cars to the TV and film industry. But in addition to that, I guess their main business is track day events. So a lot of the cars are a little bit worse for wear. They've had hard lives. The car that I chose to drive that day, and the weather was terrible, the conditions really weren't, weren't prime for this kind of car, was a Dodge Charger RT, just like the one featured in Fast and the Furious. This actual Dodge Charger was used in the promotion of Fast and the Furious 37? 106? Which, what are we up to now with it? Anyway, it wasn't the nicest example. I got shouted at by a Welshman for using the exit as an entrance or vice versa. The conditions were horrendous. I couldn't see anything because it had this fake engine thing sticking out of the bonnet. 
It was wet inside, it was noisy, it was smelly, I couldn't see anything, all I could hear was the drone from the engine, it just was without doubt the worst thing I've driven in 2023. I'm sure it'd be good fun on a track day hopping in and out of other famous movie cars, but in rush hour traffic in Pembrokeshire or wherever we were, that's not the car you want to be in. The last car on my list of worst cars I've bought and driven this year is my Mercedes CL500. Now this was a mistake from start to finish. I paid £1,500 for it, which on the face of it is very cheap for a CL500. It had only done 70 odd thousand miles, the interior was in good condition. I thought I could save it. That wasn't the case. I took it to SPR, who are a Mercedes specialist over in Stockport, who I always use, and they roundly condemned it. The trouble is with those kinds of cars, parts are so expensive and they're so complicated, it just wouldn't be a viable repair. I could have spent easily £8,000 on that car, and at the end of the day it would have been worth Four? Five, maybe? In the end, because I'm a very shrewd businessman, I sold it to a Mercedes specialist who were gonna use it and break it for parts. Do you wanna know what I sold it for? Bear in mind I paid 1,500 pounds for it. I spent another 250 pounds on it. I got it trailered to SPR for an inspection. I put a new battery on it. So it owed me around about 1,750. I sold it for, drum roll, 750. 750 pounds. That wasn't my wisest decision ever. This is the trouble with me doing this job. There are occasions, many occasions actually, where I let my heart rule my head and I should really try and not do that. Although I suppose it does make for decent YouTube videos, doesn't it? So anyway. Well, I think that concludes my naughty and nice list. So thank you once again for watching my videos all year. I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. I hope you all have a happy and healthy 2024. Cheers guys, I'll see you next year. Yeah.